It's normal to be normal in child sexual abuse. Um, my name is Chad Sievers. I'm with the Arkansas Building Effective Services for Trauma program, which is operated out of the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences Psych Psychiatric Research Institute. Um, and our mission is to improve the outcomes for traumatized children, their families in Arkansas through the excellence, excellence in clinical care, training, advocacy, and evaluation. Um, before I, uh, we begin our presentation, I do have a couple of housekeeping items to, to go over. So if you would like to ask a question during the presentation, we encourage you to do that. Please use the question feature, which is on the right side of your screen. And um, if you'd like to earn a CEU, just be sure to stick around to the very end. A code will be given, and you'll need to email that to me. If you're watching as part of a group, each person will need to email me individually. Um, we are recording this webinar, and so we'll upload it, the presentation to um, our website and our YouTube channel. And also, if you're on Facebook, um, we're on there as well, and we frequently post in you know events such as this, webinars. Um, on our Facebook page, so be sure to check us out there. Okay, <clears throat> Dr. Karen Farst is a clinical, is a child abuse pediatrician at Arkansas Children's Hospital. She is an associate professor in the College of Medicine Department of Pediatrics at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences and director for the University Center for Children at Risk. She is a past president of the National Children's Alliance Board of Directors and she earned her bachelor's and medical degree from Texas Tech University and then completed a residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at UAMS. Following a child abuse fellowship at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, she completed a Master's of Public of Health from the Faye Bozeman um, College of Public Health at UAMS. Um, so, uh, Dr. Varst, um, the presentation is yours, and thank you for doing this presentation for us. Thanks, Chad, and um, thank you all for taking time to join. I guess it is good afternoon. It's 12.02. So it's always a little bit odd to do a webinar and sit in an office and talk to yourself. Um, so I'm going to imagine folks out there. But as Chad said, um, please do uh, type in questions. I, I don't think that the information that I have will be difficult to cover in an hour. So I think we, we will have time if there's information I didn't cover or other questions that pop up as we're going through the um, presentation. If I can find my little arrows down here, there we go. So um, as, as Chad described, so I'm a pediatrician, so I'm kind of on the front end when a disclosure or a concern of sexual abuse comes up. And um, our job is to do the medical evaluation for sexual abuse. So I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of when those are needed um, and the timing of kind of which ones are urgent or not, um, talk about where these occur, but then really spend um, some time talking not necessarily to teach you guys how to do the exam or interpret the findings, but why there oftentimes aren't physical findings, even when there's a really clear disclosure of contact and even contact with penetration. And then um, I'm going to try not to go too far out of bounds just in my expertise, but we're going to talk a little bit about disclosures in kids too because that, that does impact um, kind of our, our ability to see these kids sometimes in a real timely manner to pick up injuries if they if they are there. And this slide is, is really probably preaching to the choir for this group. Um, I know for, for folks that are kind of involved with our best, you guys um, likely have a very good understanding of some of the different dynamics between child sexual abuse and sexual assault. But I'm going to highlight a couple of things just because this is going to play into the discussion that we have about why there um, often aren't findings. So. And, and the first thing just to point out is that this is not a, um, a chart that, that doesn't have any crossover. So there certainly are aspects of sexual assault that can happen with child sexual abuse. So we certainly do have um, stranger abductions of children and have forced episodes that have horrible uh, physical injuries. But the majority of the time in child sexual abuse, the offender is known to the child and even to the family. And the offender uses that relationship as a way to kind of build a relationship so that the child doesn't necessarily see it as something that's wrong. We're, we're great at teaching kids to be 
uh, afraid of strangers and to tell if a, if a stranger does something. But we also teach kids to be very respectful of the folks that are in their family or the kid, people that are in authority over them. And so it, it can put kids in a bind sometimes as far as trying to figure out if this is a right relationship or not that somebody is forming with them. So that dynamic of oftentimes being known and kind of using the relationship as a way to really escalate things over time, and that, that term is often called grooming, which just means starting with things that are kind of less invasive and move into things that are more invasive over time. And again, even in a way that the child may not even realize it's wrong or that it gets to the point that um, the child doesn't feel like they can tell because they've been made to feel like this is their fault or that they will get in trouble if they tell. So that oftentimes leads to a couple of the big dynamics of, of why we don't often see findings is because these oftentimes aren't um, kind of the violent, forcible things you might think of with sexual assault where somebody is you know, tackled and held down and, and ligatures and things like that. But also, we don't oftentimes get to see these cases medically within a time frame where we can try to collect DNA evidence or to see them right after something has happened to even be able to see kind of subtle bruises or petechiae. Uh, so that delay in disclosure and the fact that this is kind of a grooming process over time are a couple of the factors that really play into the fact that we oftentimes don't have physical findings on these cases. Um, it's not to say that sexual assault cases always have physical findings either. There's a lot that can happen in sexual assault that doesn't necessarily leave physical injury behind. But we're usually talking about less than 10% of kids um, will have physical findings for child sexual abuse, whereas in sexual assault, it's usually more um, up in the probably 20 to 30% range of um, people that are seen will have some type of, type of physical finding uh, when they are evaluated. I'm going to coax my little slide to change here. Uh, so talking about the medical evaluations themselves, I think most of you are probably familiar with the Children's Advocacy Centers in the state. So the Children's Advocacy Centers are actually tied to um, a national group called the National Children's Alliance, and um, they set uh, best standards of practice in multiple different fields that impact uh, kids that have been um, sexually abused. So. There are medical standards for best practice. There are mental health that um, you all may have had more uh, exposure to from the our best standpoint. So as I talk about kind of some of the best practice recommendations for the medical evaluation and kind of how those came to be, this is really one of the, the foundational places uh, for us to go to for information is the information that's been compiled by the um, National Children's Alliance. And I think we're really fortunate in Arkansas that we, we do have um, a strong group of children's advocacy centers, and they um, have done quite a bit to advance the, the really kind of bringing evidence-based practice into the community level. Um, that has been through TFCBT. Um, that's just been amazing to watch over the past several years, but it's also been in the medical field as well. Um, there's some folks that have uh, taken the time to get specialized training to provide these types of exams in the community setting so they don't have to drive all the way to Little Rock. Uh, and those folks have also been able to serve to kind of educate their MDT about some of the things that we will talk about today in, in regards to lack of findings. So when a child makes a disclosure or there's a concern that sexual abuse has occurred, the, the timeline that we ha try to figure out early on with um, the investigators is whether or not it's something that's happened um, acutely, uh, which in, in this field is usually less than 72 hours. That 72 hour time frame is based off of the fact that that's kind of the window where collecting DNA evidence off of the body is most likely. So that um, timeline was set really kind of based off of studies of seeing you know how far out from an event you can get DNA evidence off of the body. Um, so less than 72 hours would be the time where we would say well, they need to have an exam right away so we could try to collect an evidence kit. But at the same time, even if it's beyond 72 hours, if the child has provided a disclosure where, uh, for say, that something happened in the bed and there was white sticky stuff that came out of the offender onto the bed, so we would really encourage police to kind of get underwear and clothes and bedding even beyond that 72-hour mark because that's actually the most common place that we'll see uh, foreign DNA recovered um, in these cases. But as far as us recommending when kids need to come in right away versus when they can wait and have something scheduled, it's typically that 72-hour time frame. 
And then we also just kind of have to take into consideration if they are having any kind of urgent symptoms. So is it a child that's bleeding right now? Are they having pain? Um, and then for kids that have already started to have their periods, do we need to worry about providing um, prophylactic medications for um, STD infections in pregnancy when, when it would be the appropriate scenario? Many of the cases, especially in young kids, just from the dynamics that we talked about, will kind of fall into this non-urgent category. And for these, one of our big efforts to try to educate our MDT partners is that there's really no rush to get these kids to, to have a medical. So these kids are much better served if we kind of wait and set them up with somebody that we know is trained in how to do these exams. We spend a lot of time kind of undoing exams that were done by folks that don't necessarily have training in how to do them. And so, A, that can traumatize the child, um, and B, it can give the investigators kind of some inaccurate information to launch off on their investigation. So sometimes we do need to kind of try to um, find a place for them to have an exam right away, but a lot of times it's encouraging the system to kind of slow down, pull the reins in, and let's make sure we schedule them with somebody that really has training in, in um, how to do an appropriate assessment. So these evaluations take place in lots of different settings across the state, so emergency departments might do them, um, like we talked about the Children's Advocacy Centers uh, across the state, many of them have a nurse or a physician provider that's available to do these exams. Um, some of the CACs provide 24-7 coverage, but some of them have a single nurse and they just can't be on call 24-7 all the time. So each MDT or multidisciplinary team really just kind of has to know what services are available in their community. Um, there are, you know, a lot of times these uh, families will self-present to their primary care provider's office, um, either with a complaint of something like vaginal discharge that might need further workup or that the child has made a disclosure. So um, the, the primary care provider's offices, some of them are comfortable doing the exams, some are not. Really, to, to do an, an in-depth exam, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that entails, it really does need to be somebody that has specific training in how to do these exams. We, we aren't really taught how to do these appropriately or in-depth enough in medical or nursing school. And so uh, if you're thinking about who's around in your community, it really does need to be somebody that's had some training kind of beyond medical school or nursing school in how to do this. Um, it needs to be somebody that's willing to kind of stay current on the field. So we have educate or we have research going on, and it's important to stay up to date on kind of what are the most current best practices. And then one of the big issues in our field is that there is a tendency and just kind of an inclination to overcall findings in these exams. Um, there's there's oftentimes a lot of pressure put on the medical provider to to have a finding because it kind of helps the case go better if there's a physical finding. And so we really have to participate in a review of exam findings with our peers and with people that are even more qualified than us to make sure that we're kind of staying on the line and not being tempted to kind of overcall something because we know that it's going to help the case go better if we do have a finding and if we say something that's not necessarily significant, if we try to assign significance to it, it can really derail the process because then it would get the investigators kind of off on a tangent that might um, kind of interfere with them coming to the best conclusion in their case file. So the reasons why we do the exams, um, so as we talked about, if it is a situation where we can try to collect DNA evidence, then we certainly want to take advantage of that opportunity because if that's there, then that's great evidence and, and it does um, obviously help the investigation part. But as we talked about, we're oftentimes not having the opportunity to see those kids right away. But the medical evaluation is really much, much more than a search for evidence. So we want to identify that if it's there. We want to see if there are acute or healed injuries. But we also want to test for medical issues that could be related to the sexual contact. So that would be STDs and pregnancy. But we also want to do just an overall medical evaluation because many times, especially in child sexual abuse, these kids have other medical issues that haven't been addressed as well, especially if it's an abuse situation that's happening kind of within the family setting. There may be other, there may be other neglect issues or things like that that need to be addressed. Um, but then some of the other um, indications beyond just kind of what we would see on the exam is to really try to help reassure the patient and the family that their body is okay after what's happened. 
when abuse has gone on for a, a period of time, a lot of times the kids have been kind of talked into and convinced that, that their bodies are ruined or that they're different or that they're damaged or just all different things that kind of really weigh on their self-esteem and their understanding of what's happened. So being able to really just sit and tell them that everything's fine on their body, to me, is a, is a huge part of it. Um, so even if there's not evidence to be found, I think there's still um, a big benefit to being able to do the medical evaluation in, in the right way. Um, we spend some time when we do them just talking about behavioral symptoms that the child might have. I, we do not do an, a, formal, a formal assessment as what you would probably be used to for your intakes for TFCBT. But we do just ask a medical review of systems and we'll oftentimes use some of those behavior symptoms that they may be describing, such as stomach aches, headaches, nightmares, those types of things. We will use those as a way to say, those are things that are telling you that your child has suffered stress. And so it is really important to follow through on that referral that, um, that we're telling you about for an assessment for trauma-focused therapy. Um, that's something that, that I take really seriously and I try to encourage other folks is to use our position of being the medical provider for the child and the family to, to really advocate for them to follow through with an assessment for TFCBT because that is the number one thing that they could do from that point forward besides keeping the child safe would be to have them um, involved in that type of a um, therapy relationship. So, so it is more than just a search for evidence. Um, I think a lot of times people focus on the evidence when they think about the medical evaluation, but there's, there's really a lot more going on there. Um, uh, that, that, that I think the kids and the families will benefit from. So the, the who and the how of the medical evaluation, um, I think we've kind of talked some about this. So we definitely want to look and see if there are physical findings that are of concern. We want to test for STDs in pregnancy. One of the, the uh, markers that could probably tell you if, um, if the person in your community that's providing exams is really kind of up to date with best practices is whether or not they are doing photo documentation of their exam findings. So the photo documentation has a little bit of a dual role. Um, if we uh, capture the images, then if there is an abnormal finding that needs to be contested from a court standpoint, then there's photo documentation of that and the child doesn't have to go through multiple examinations if somebody wants to argue whether the finding is um, significant or not. But the other is what we talked about a bit, that uh, it's really important from a medical provider standpoint to participate in some continuing quality improvement, or CQI, because that's um, uh, been played out time and time again in the literature. If you look at medical providers who do have uh, training and experience versus those that don't, those that don't tend to very much overcall insignificant findings as significant. And so this quality assurance or CQI process is, is really very important as far as accuracy and making sure the best information is, is getting out from the medical exam to, the, um, uh, to whoever it is with the MDT that's doing the assessment. For those of you that, that either work with or, or have been into the CACs, you might have seen some of these different um, options that are used for photo documentation. So we'll talk a little bit about the exam itself, but it, we are not talking about kind of an internal scope type of exam. So most of the time I don't even use a, a speculum, which is what is usually used if you're thinking about an examination for a pap smear or somebody that's pregnant, something like that. We really are just trying to get a magnified, lighted view of the entrance to the vagina in girls and then also the anal area in boys and girls. So, so all we really need to accomplish for photo documentation is something that has a light source and something that magnifies that area and then in a way to capture that. So that could be video, that could be still. So there's, there's all sorts of different options out there from a couple of thousand dollars of what you could build with a, just kind of a handy cam that goes on a tripod to something that's made by a medical company and costs $20,000. So there's a big range in what's out there, but it's, it really just has to kind of um, accomplish the purpose that's there. One of the um, uh, things that we try to, again, help families understand, because a lot of times if a child has a disclosure in a forensic interview and either the advocate or the investigator says, well, we, we really think that child should have a medical evaluation, I think a lot of times, especially for moms, they have this fear that, oh my gosh, you're going to do like a pap smear exam on my three-year-old or four-year-old, like when I go to the gynecologist. 
So we try to really help our MDT partners and, and help people understand that the exam we do is, is actually not invasive. We're not, again, doing an internal type of an exam. And when the exams are done correctly, they really they aren't painful. They're obviously awkward just because you have to be undressed and we have to look in that area. And we do have to kind of touch on the, the skin and be able to kind of look. But, but we're not doing, I think, what a lot of people think of doing an adult type of an exam on a young child. Um, and that's one of the biggest fears or concerns, and it's what we hear from people of why they either you know don't show up for appointments or or refuse to basically have a medical done. And unfortunately, I still hear this from our investigative colleagues as well that they don't refer kids for medicals because they think it's traumatizing. And I'm sure that there are kids out there that have had very traumatizing exams by people that haven't been trained how to do them. Uh, but if if you do have a qualified provider in your area, just wanted to try to reassure you that we really aren't physically re-traumatizing these kids by doing like a penetrating type of an exam. So I will sometimes use a speculum on a teenager, especially if they've been sexually active and they can tolerate that well, but I would never use a speculum on a young girl that hasn't even gone through puberty yet, and I would really only use a speculum on a um, teenager or an adolescent who's been through puberty that could tolerate it. So when we're actually doing the exams, and I, I promise there's not going to be a bunch of um, icky pictures on here, but I just I wanted folks to have kind of a bit of a visualization of when we do the exams, um, and this would obviously be for a young girl, so she's just laying on a table with kind of her legs in um, kind of Indian style or just her, her knees kind of flopped out to the side. And really what we're trying to do is just separate the labia majora so that we can see to the entrance of the vagina, and the vagina has some skin around it called the hymen, H-Y-M-E-N. And so to see that, sometimes you can see it just by kind of separating. Sometimes you have to actually gently kind of pinch on the labia majora and pull towards uh, the examiner. That's called traction. So um, again, if this is kind of done gently and explaining to the child, this, this doesn't hurt. It doesn't really hurt to touch on the labia area. This, the place you have to be careful not to touch on a young child is actually the hymen itself. Once before the hymen gets estrogenized, it's very sensitive to touch. Once it uh, gets the estrogen effect and you start to go through puberty, it gets less sensitive to touch in that area. And that's going to be an important factor to remember as we talk about kind of how we can put together what the child says to what the exam findings are. But again, this is, this is really all we have to do for the exam to be able to see if there's any damage around the area where the, where the hymen is around the opening to the vagina. So we, we really don't have to do kind of an internal um, scope um, exam. And this picture is really just to show you a bit of the benefit that having a lighted magnified source provides. So I think you can hopefully see, so here's a penny on, um, so here's our teddy bear and he's in front of that. And so the penny is up on his tummy, kind of just between his, his little bathrobe right there. And so with this system, this is the level of magnification and view that we can get of that penny even from that far away. So if we're talking about trying to see this structure um, and make sure that it doesn't look like there's any kind of injury around that area. Again, we all we need some type of light source to be able to see in that area, but it's very, very helpful to be able to magnify that area as well so that we can really see if there's something that's an injury versus just something that was kind of a variant in how things were formed in that area. So, so this is really whatever kind of system you might see in a children's advocacy center or in a clinic, this is kind of the, the effect that we're trying to get is a very magnified, lighted view of that area. So this, this is kind of just a blown up view of that, and I think this is the last um, private part picture to have to endure over your lunch hour. But what we're actually trying to identify is this skin that goes around the opening to the vagina. It's called the hymen. And so a lot of people, and this is including medical providers, a lot of people think that the hymen like covers the vagina until you either start to have your periods or you have some type of sexual contact. It, has, it is actually a ring or like a collar that goes around the opening to the vagina and there's an opening in it. So even a newborn, even a little baby, if you do the right type of traction, there is an opening there. There's a rare condition where people will have an imperforate or a closed hymen, but it's actually very, very rare. So this skin also, the other kind of unique thing about uh, this part of your body is this skin is the same type of skin that's on the inside of your mouth. It's called mucosal skin. So it's very stretchy, very elastic, uh, and so I think when folks look at this area, they're like, well, gosh, how could there ever potentially be penetration without causing some kind of terrible damage there? 
And the, the fact is, is that this area is actually very elastic and can, um, can dilate, can stretch to accommodate quite a bit without causing any kind of a tear or, or damage to that area. And that's even more so as the hymen uh, is exposed to estrogen because the, the further developed you get, the more kind of stretchy and redundant the hymen gets as well, which makes sense biologically. So even if you haven't had a sexual encounter and you start to have your periods, you actually can use a tampon because the, your body does um, have some changes as it goes through and gets um, further developed and, and estrogen starts to circulate. Sorry, one more picture. I thought I, thought I was out of the woods with pictures on you. But this is just to give you an idea of, of what we are really actually looking at with that magnified view of the hymen. We want to see if the hymen does look like it has a defect that could have been some type of prior injury in the past that then didn't heal together, um, or whether it just kind of has some very nonspecific little kind of dips and, and valleys in it. So uh, this is really kind of the, again, I'm not trying to teach you guys how to uh, uh, interpret the exam, but just to give you a feel for this is the, kind of the level of the detail that we're looking at to try to uh, determine if there's healed injury or not. And this may be a little too visual for you, but so I was talking about kind of how elastic the hymen can be. And uh, one of the visuals that some colleagues will use in court is, is a scrunchie. So a scrunchie that you would use to pull back your ponytail it can look like it has actually no opening in it whatsoever. But then uh, with the elastic that's around there, obviously if you pull on it or if you, and you can stretch it out even further than that, you can get the, the very visual sense that because of the elasticity of it, it actually has quite a bit of stretch so it can hold the ponytail. Um, I usually in court don't necessarily use the scrunchie but just kind of talk with my hands and describe it. But this whole idea of the fact that it's normal to be normal is, is based off of an article from back in the late 90s where where we really started to figure this out from a research basis, that the majority of the kids that have been sexually abused have a normal exam. So it's actually normal to have a normal exam, even if you've been the victim of sexual abuse. And I spend the majority of my time in sexual abuse probably explaining this, because if there is an injury or if there is DNA on the rape kit, then those cases are much more likely to, to plead out and not necessarily have a contested um, case in court. If a child gives a very clear disclosure of abuse and yet there are no physical findings, those are the cases that would typically end up in court. And so it's my job to try to help the judge and the jury understand that um, just because the exam is normal, it doesn't mean that they shouldn't listen to the disclosure that the child is providing. So we've talked a little bit about um, some of the reasons for this. So the type of skin is the mucosal skin. Um, the, that mucosal skin is, is also part of the fact that when there are injuries in that part of the body, they heal really, really quickly, and they do not typically uh, leave the same type of scar tissue behind as you would think about as your regular skin. I think most people have probably bitten on the inside of their lip before, and they know that it can feel really, really rough and rugged right when that happens. But the inside of your mouth heals quickly. It's pretty unusual for us to have to put stitches into mouth trauma, and it's the same thing with trauma down in the anal and genital area. Uh, that mucosal skin does tend to heal really quickly and uh, doesn't heal with, with oftentimes visible scar tissue. The, the other big um, reason for people to kind of understand uh, why there aren't typical, typically findings is, is really the meaning of penetration. When I say meaning of penetration, it's really what kind of meaning we as adults put on that when the child is describing. And I think you guys will probably understand this description more sometimes even than my law enforcement colleagues because you're, you're used to how kids describe stuff uh, uh, in their own words and just kind of with their own developmental level. Um, and, and I, that's an encouragement that I try to give to MDTs is when, when a child's describing something, try not to put our adult uh, kind of definitions or conceptions on top of that. So when we talked about, I'm going to flip back just a couple of slides, when we talked about the fact that the um, hymen is actually pretty sensitive to touch until um, uh, it starts to have estrogen. Uh, so this area, before you have estrogen come into effect, if you touch that, the child will say, ow, that hurts. And so when we're doing these exams on young children, we have to actually be pretty careful not to touch the hymen or they will get upset with us and end the exam. 
So the one thing this picture doesn't really show you is that there is depth to this area. So the examiner's hands are out on the labia majora, and we usually will kind of pull forward on that. And so between the labia majora and where the hymen is down at the, at the opening of the vagina, there's a couple of inches of depth to that area. So a lot of times what will happen in little kids is that there is penetration of the labia majora, which is what the Arkansas definition of penetration is. You don't have to prove vaginal penetration to say that there was penetrating sexual contact. So something penetrates into the labia majora, rubs up against this area, and the child says, ow, that went in and it hurt me. Because the prepubertal child does not have a concept of putting a tampon in or having a sexual contact or you know, they, they don't really know anything other than something went in towards their body and caused them pain. So because of the dynamics of child sexual abuse, many of the folks that offend on young kids will do just that type of interaction. They won't necessarily penetrate the vagina, but they will penetrate the labia and, and rub and do whatever they need for their sexual gratification. But there's actually not penetration of the vagina, so there's really no expectation that the hymen would have to be disrupted in those types of cases. There are certainly cases where the hymen does get penetrated and it can without causing uh, damage, but the point of this kind of um, um, detailed description, I guess, is really to have people uh, understand that when a child is just, a young child is describing in and hurt, they're not necessarily telling you that something had to go into the vagina. And so I'll apologize for using the hot dog analogy over the lunch hour, but again, I think when, when we as adults think of sexual contact, we think of a penis penetrating into the vagina. When a lot of times what's happening in child sexual abuse is if the labia or the hot dog bun and the hot dog is the penis, the contact is actually going up and down this way instead of down through the hymen. So child's reporting, ow, that's in, it hurt, but it's really not what is vaginal penetration from our kind of adult understanding of intercourse. So if you're still out there, I don't see a lot of people signing out yet, so that's good, now that I've talked about hot dogs and every other things over lunch. The, I, I spend a lot of time on this just because there is so much of a conception in our society in the U.S. and around the world that something has to pop or break or bleed uh, the first time that there is some type of sexual contact, regardless of the age of the child. So in our culture, you oftentimes hear that, that the cherry has to pop, and so there's kind of this idea that the hymen is the cherry, and so in order for something to get into the vagina, something basically has to kind of be obliterated, and so if that's the case, then there would have to be medical findings afterwards. And so this is really a hard thing to get past with families, with juries, with investigators, with judges, with fellow medical colleagues that that really is a myth. So there certainly are people that have a tear of their hymen and have bleeding when they have um, intercourse either for the first time or just on a rough consecutive time, but that is not the norm per se. Um, so again, penetration of the labia can occur that won't have anything, but also the hymen can be penetrated because of its elasticity without necessarily leaving or causing any kind of damage that then would heal to a defect or a scar. So I've been doing this for, I guess, about 14 years now, and so it's, it's easy for me to say I've seen a lot of kids that have given really, really clear disclosures and had no findings. Uh, but it's also nice because this is backed up in the literature. So if somebody wants to say, well, I just don't agree with your opinion, that's fine. But there's a, a couple of really nice studies that, that I can use in court if somebody wants to challenge that. The first one is from Texas, and it's a study of 36 pregnant teenagers. And so if you're pregnant, something's gone past your hymen and into your vagina, probably even on more than one occasion, but at least once. And so in this case, they had 36 teenagers that were pregnant. They did that photo documentation of their genital area, and then they had people that didn't know the history of uh, the fact that the uh, patient was pregnant review the photo documentation. And only two out of those 36 had definitive findings of some kind of tear or healed injury to the hymen that would say there had been vaginal penetration before. So folks will say, well, yeah, that's the, that's the estrogenized, redundant, real stretchy hymen in teenagers. So, but if you're talking about a six, seven, or eight-year-old, then there's no way that that same thing could happen. So the six, seven, and eight-year-olds obviously can't get pregnant, so we can't reproduce that study in that population. But we see a lot of six, seven, and eight-year-olds that have 
sexually transmitted diseases, something like chlamydia or gonorrhea, that requires intimate sexual contact in order for it to get transmitted. And the majority of those kids that have confirmed STDs in the anal and genital area don't have any evidence of uh, penetration from a physical examination finding when we do that. So, so again, that's a nice study that we have in the literature that really kind of backs up the fact that we're trying to dispel this myth that there has to be some kind of physical finding if uh, sexual abuse with penetration has occurred. So the when you kind of look at all the literature, it's, it's really over 90% of kids who have been sexually abused will have normal exams. And this actually does include kids that have had uh, penetration and even multiple episodes of penetration. Um, acute assault, so if, if, if your practice as a medical provider is that's all you do is do acute exams within that 72-hour time frame, you might have a higher than 10% abnormal finding rate but it's probably not going to be higher than 20%. So even with acute assault, there's still a lot that can happen without leaving any kind of um, permanent damage behind. So when we fill out the medical report, if there is evidence of trauma, so say we do see a, a tear or we see a, a part of the hymen that was damaged and didn't, didn't heal back correctly, so we can say it does look like there's been penetrating trauma, but we can't really assign uh, specificity to what object caused that. So was that a penis? Was it a finger? Was it some other kind of foreign object? Can't really say that. And we also can't say a lot about the timing, especially if it's already healed. So if it's a fresh injury, then we would know that's you know something probably within the last week or so. But if it's a healed injury, that mucosal skin can heal within a week. And so I can't tell you if it was two weeks ago or two months ago and sometimes even up to a couple of years ago. And then the other part of trauma is that I, I can't necessarily look at that injury and tell you if it was consensual or non-consensual. Um, some of the worst um, genital injuries I've seen that actually did have to have surgical repair were, were part of a consensual event. So obviously if you see ligatures on somebody's, um, you know, like tie marks on somebody's wrists or neck or, you know, other things that kind of show you that there was some kind of restraint, then that would lead you obviously to the non-consensual side of things. But just from the genital injury area, uh, we really can't tell the difference just by how things look. And I think we've talked about this second point, obviously, um, uh, probably more than you wanted to talk about, this fact that there's, if there is no evidence of trauma, it certainly doesn't mean that the child wasn't sexually abused. It does not mean that the child is lying. And it doesn't mean that there's uh, no chance to develop infection or pregnancy. Um, we've actually had several cases in this past week <coughs> where um, kids had normal exams and we did screening tests for STDs just because of the history and the tests have come back positive with STDs and we wouldn't have really known that if we hadn't done the test because the examination itself wouldn't have told us that the child had an STD. <coughs> So if we do recover an STD, um, the other things that it's, I think we always frustrate our, our investigator colleagues because it's, it's often hard to tell them exactly when the child would have had to have been exposed to get the STD. So it could be anywhere from a couple of days to a couple of months. Um, and so we don't really have the CSI technology at this point to take the child's STD and then uh, find an STD in another person and link those together by a DNA standpoint. So. If the child tests positive and says that Uncle Joe is the one that sexually abused her and Uncle Joe tests positive, then that's obviously very corroborative, but I can't link those two together in a kind of a scientific way. Uh, but also, if, if the child um, discloses that Uncle Joe abused her and she has an STD, if you go test Uncle Joe and he tests negative, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's not the offender or that the child's not telling the truth because um, uh, the adults, you can go to the health department and get treated anonymously and so kind of unfortunately oftentimes by the time we get a test result back on a child and it gets to the police and then they get to the person, information has kind of filtered back through the grapevine and so most folks if they kind of know they might be in that boat have an opportunity to go to the health department and get treated anonymously before they be tested for the investigation. Uh, the other aspect is that um, if you have a healthy immune system, you can clear infections on your own. So if the, especially if the um, event happened a couple of months ago, the person's immune system can take care of that infection so that by the time they get tested, they would test negative. Uh, you can think of strep throat as an analogy. If you have a strep throat infection and you go to the doctor, 
that and you and you're diagnosed with that, they will usually put you on antibiotics because you'll get better faster and you'll have less of a chance to have complications from the infection. But if you have strep throat and you don't go to the doctor, most people will get better. It'll just take them longer. They'll feel bad longer and they'll have a chance to have some of the complications that you could have from strep. But so same thing with any of the other bacterial infections is that you, you can clear it over time if you have a healthy immune system. And it does actually flip the other way as well. So if there is a sexually transmitted infection in the alleged offender, but the child tests negative, it doesn't again necessarily mean that that person is not an offender or that the child's not telling the truth. So there's thankfully not necessarily a one-to-one -one ratio of being exposed to an STD and actually developing the infection. Um, and so same type of uh, explanation that we just provided as well, that if it especially wasn't a recent contact, the child's immune system could have taken care of that exposure uh, as well. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the specific STDs, but uh, it, these do come up quite a bit um, for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and trichomonas especially as far as how they could get them because it is, it is very, very common, especially for the young six, seven, and eight-year-olds that, that we do diagnose with STDs for them really to not provide a disclosure up front about where that came from. And again, if you think through all those dynamics that we've talked about, it, it you know, makes sense that they might not feel comfortable to, they might not realize a contact that they should be talking about. But these are, if we find these infections, um, the gonorrhea, chlamydia, and trichomonas in kids that are out of the infancy period. So if you're older than a year old and we're not talking about things that, um, that maybe mom could have passed to them through delivery, and we ought to be able to get prenatal records and kind of figure some of that out anyway. But it really requires uh, infected wet secretions of these infections to come in contact with the part of the body that tests positive in order for that to happen. So that's why they're called sexually transmitted infections. It's, it's not something that you get sneezed on or um, that you get from the toilet seat. Um, there, you know, there are some potential non-sexual ways to get these, but they would require some really bad hygiene practices and like you know, sharing a washcloth that doesn't get washed out between times and so there is still fresh secretion on there, but once it gets a chance to dry, it's, it's not gonna pass it on that way. And these are gross conversations, and I know people don't like to think about this stuff, but a lot of times when we do have a six, seven, or eight-year-old that's not disclosing, then you know, obviously people want to find other reasons for the STD to be there instead of considering that this is a child that has been sexually abused and is just not disclosing at this point. Probably about half of the kids that we have had um, kind of go through that process that if things are kind of taken seriously and they're, they're into therapy and into counseling, about half of these kids will disclose um, once they are kind of in a situation where they're kind of figuring out the dynamic and they know it's safe and what, you know, whatever has been keeping them from doing that, a lot of times they will disclose uh, further on down the line. Um, so some of the, the, we talked about kind of the reasons why the medical is done and, and um, a lot of times the history can be helpful when we're trying to put this together and, and this mostly pertains to the fact that when those young prepubertal kids will describe that something was in and hurt, from a medical standpoint I can I think hopefully explain that to the jury or investigators that what that child is saying is that their labia was penetrated and that their hymen was contacted. So we can oftentimes, even if there's not um, a finding that we can document with a photograph, we can oftentimes, I think, provide some context um, as far as just what's going on with the body and, and what the child is saying. So uh, I, I can't watch these shows at night when I go home because they just, I guess, drive me crazy now with the work I do because, you know, these guys are so doggone smart that within a one-hour time show they can figure out who did it from a strand of hair and where that person is right now and how many different crimes they've committed in the past. And so it's just, it's obviously not that easy. Um, but there's a lot of people that do expect this level of technology um, when a child has had a medical evaluation, especially if a rape kit's been collected. And so it's, you know, we kind of call it funnily the CSI effect, but it's actually very real that there's this expectation that we should kind of be able to do more with what we do with the medical evaluation. It's actually pretty uncommon to be able to recover DNA from the body of a young child. 
We've talked through some of those dynamics that a lot of times this isn't necessarily vaginal intercourse, and so a lot of times the ejaculation event is not necessarily occurring into the vagina. It's occurring onto the child's body or into the bedding, which is why it's so important to kind of pick up some of those ancillary things with the um, investigation. Um, and we, we really thankfully don't have um, a high level of transmission of sexual infections. And so there, there's really oftentimes not this, this kind of um, smoking gun type of thing that these guys are always so good at finding. And we are oftentimes trying to help people understand why they can still listen to the child's disclosure, even if there's not physical findings there. And so if I'm prepping with a prosecutor in a normal to be normal case, I'll have them ask me on the, the end of kind of the direct, which is that first session where the prosecutor is allowing me to kind of tell the story about why normal is normal. And I'll have them ask, you know, did it surprise you that there weren't any physical findings um, with the history that's been given? Because I really want to say no and kind of debunk those myths before the defense attorney gets to get up and say, you know, how can you say that uh, an adult male could sexually abuse? Because that, that really is what everybody thinks and believes. And so I think it's important to try to do as much explaining uh, beforehand so that, that people really can start to understand uh, why. You know, there's usually not findings. And I told you I was going to talk just a little bit about disclosure as well because I, I hear this um, uh, when I'm talking about the medical findings that um, I'll be going into the room and, and an investigator or somebody will say, well, doc, it's, it's kind of all on you because if there's not any findings, then um, there's really not anything we're going to be able to do with the case. And it's it, that, that kind of statement is just frustrating. I mean, I understand that we have to have a burden of evidence to be able to go forward in cases, but I think it's also important for us to kind of understand how kids disclose, why it's hard for them to disclose, because a lot of times I'll hear people say, well, if there's no physical findings, then I have to decide just if I'm going to believe what the child is saying. And so they're going to try to find reasons not to believe what the child says. And so that is, well, if it really would have happened, they would have told right away. They wouldn't have waited. Or if it had really happened, then they would actually be showing much more emotion during their disclosure than just being able to talk about these horrific events like they just happened. And so, you know, again, I know I'm preaching to the choir um, that I think you guys probably understand that you know, dynamics of child development and, and some of the reasons why they delay. But there's some really nice information in the literature as well to kind of back this up. But the, the second part of this discussion as far as it's normal to have a normal physical exam is to me it's actually very normal for kids to delay as well. So when kids don't delay, that's actually not the norm. You know, we really only probably get to intervene with kind of the tip of the iceberg of these cases in childhood. Uh, this was one of the, the, there's several studies like this out there, but this was a study that interviewed over 3,000 adults by an anonymous telephone interview and asked them about their childhood rape experiences. And 9% of the group uh, described that they had had a childhood rape experience. And that's probably about norm for most of the studies that about 10% of people um, do describe that something happened to them from a sexual assault standpoint in, in childhood. But then they broke this down, which is what was kind of nice about this study, is they asked this group, so when did you tell about this? So a little less than a quarter of them actually told right away. Um, a little more than a quarter, it took them about one to six months. This smaller group of maybe kind of 10 or 15 percent, they told in about one to five years. But the majority of this group, uh, it was more than five years since they had told. And when you actually look within this group, this interview was the first time they had ever talked about it. So 28% of this group, the first time they were disclosing is when they were asked as an adult. Uh, and so, again, for, for folks to really understand that, you know, because of all those dynamics that are there, delay is definitely the norm. And I think this is common sense probably stuff to us as well, but kids are much less likely to disclose or to delay and disclose if they um, have had this happen within their family, especially if they're old enough to figure out that if they disclose there's going to be some negative consequences or if they've been made to feel that the abuse was their fault. Um, and kids who have kind of tried to tell a little bit and then either said we don't believe you or don't talk about that stuff. So those kids are much, much more likely to endorse self-blame and to think that it's their fault. And so again, there's just all these dynamics that, you know, kind of the more you work with these kids and the more you look at all this work that's been done, it really kind of amazes me that, that as many kids disclose as do because I think it is a very tough process for them. 
Um, you all may be familiar with this study already. I just include this in there because it is so powerful. And we've actually had a, a very similar case to this in Arkansas in the past couple of years. But this Schoberg case was 10 kids who were all identified on um, videotape of having um, sexual abuse occur to them by a young adult in their neighborhood. So multiple different types of events. These kids were, you could see their faces, you knew who they were. And so when they gathered these, these 10 kid victims together, um, three out of ten of them actually denied that it that they were involved in this whatsoever, even when they were kind of confronted and say, "Hey, but we saw you on the video." So, number one, so even when you know kids are faced with kind of that level of proof, they're still going to have some discomfort of, of being able to kind of admit they were in there. Interestingly, for the kids that did disclose, every incident that they described was corroborated on the video, so it kind of talked to some of the accuracy and disclosure. But none of the kids, so even the kids that disclosed, none of them were actually able to disclose everything that had been captured on video. So um, another, you know, just as far as kind of how much they were willing to tell happened, even those that were disclosing didn't say everything that happened. So pretty powerful um, stuff for people that, that try to question, you know, kind of why kids delay and, and whether or not that's real or just um, something that people kind of make up that want to try to advocate for kids. And the last part of this was, was the emotion, and this is probably even um, more so for older kids, but a lot of times we'll hear as well, especially for kind of, you know, teenagers that, well, gosh, if this had really happened, they should just be kind of sobbing and breaking down on the floor. And this study was really interesting because they looked at several videotaped um, interviews of kids making disclosure, and then they showed them to people and had them grade what the child's emotional response was. And, and most of them were kind of neutral during the disclosure, so they were just kind of talking about these horrific things and not really showing much abuse. But then they took that graded scale and then overlaid it on the number of abuse events that were that had happened to the child, and it was really pretty interesting that the uh, more abuse that had occurred to the child, actually the less emotion they showed. And again, for y'all, um, I think you would understand this as an adaptive response and that for kids that this is their daily routine, they have to incorporate that into their lives to be able to function. And so for them just to be able to rattle off what happened without showing a lot of emotion is because that's just how they have had to survive. Whereas if something happens to you out of the blue and it's totally shocking and traumatic, then you would be more likely to be emotional um, or kind of show visible emotion when you're talking about it. Uh, so those I just put in as just some references and reviews. I'm not sure how much you guys get asked that as well. I know you probably end up in court as well trying to kind of explain some of these things and the different dynamics. Um, these last slides are more kind of uh, references from a medical standpoint as far as the medical evaluation and, and injuries. But the slides prior, I think, had all the references to the um, information that we talked about from disclosures. So that was all the information that I had to present. Um, and again, just wanted to, to thank you for everything you do. I get to go out and travel quite a bit across the country and work with the National Children's Alliance. And it's really, uh, I don't, you know, if you haven't had a chance to do this, I'm out there and people ask me about our best. They say, oh, you're from Arkansas. They have that our best program. And it's, it's kind of neat because I say, well, yes, yes, I do know about the our best program. Uh, so um, this, what has happened and the work that you guys are doing actually, I think, has been very encouraging and even um, has served as a model for other states and other places to, to think about how to really expand this um, access to, to quality treatment for these kids. So thanks for what you do. So I'm going to let Dad um, try to figure out if there's any questions we can address and then um, let you guys get on your way. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Farston, for those uh, kind words. Um, so yeah, if you have questions, feel free to type those in and we'll advance to the um, CU slide um, here shortly. Um, but there is one question, is there, you mentioned um, the trained medical providers, so is there a, a list or what's the best, how would how would one search for that, just call up their, their doctor's office or is there a, a list um, somewhere of trained medical providers such as yourself? So um, there's not really a way, so Arkansas doesn't require people to kind of register as a trained provider. And so if it's, it's, it, it's probably pretty easy in Arkansas because everyone that I know of that has had kind of the in-depth training is associated with the Children's Advocacy Center. So if, you, if there is somebody in your community that's doing exams, um, that uh, process of photo documentation is, would really be kind of the litmus test to see if they were um, providing kind of evidence-based exams. 
So folks that kind of just do an exam in their office and provide a report, I think that's that's fine as far as you know, just making sure there's not any major problems or um, uh, you know anything kind of urgent that they need to send it off to the emergency department. But the types of exams that we were talking about with photo documentation, the only places that I know that those occur in the state would be at, at our clinic here at Children's or at the CACs um, around the state. Okay. Um, another kind of question slash comment. Um, so I imagine that, so if there isn't a medical finding that the families, are they relieved? Are they frustrated? What's kind of your experience? Yeah, it's, it, the, the dynamics are different within the families. I, I think the most frustrating thing to me is when the um, family comes in to the medical exam and, and they want to use the medical findings as a way to figure out whether they're going to believe the child. So we'll oftentimes spend just as much time talking with the family after the exam as we do during as we do doing the actual exam. Um, as you guys know, the dynamics in this oftentimes is that, you know, if it's a mom's boyfriend that's in the home that's been abusing the child and then the child finally does disclose, then mom has to make the decision about whether she believes her child and ends the relationship with the person who is, you know, her intimate partner and maybe the breadwinner versus just saying, well, I think the child's just trying to get the guy in trouble because she's jealous of him. And so I spend a lot of time talking to families about the fact that, you know, six and seven year olds don't learn about the th uh, describing what's happened to them from a sexual standpoint by you know watching Sesame Street and the things that they do so you really have to respect the fact that a, a well done interview and a well done disclosure on a child when they when they're allowed to kind of tell what's happened in their um, own words which is really one of the beauties of the CACs is to kind of have those non leading interviews done um, that that you really need to respect the fact that that's not something the child would really be able to make up. And it is important to believe them when they're talking about those things because uh, just like we've talked about, that if they say it and you don't believe it, they're going to take it back and potentially never tell again. And that can be ruinous to them long term. Um, even if that person moves out of their life, if they weren't believed when they made that disclosure and, and had you know the appropriate referrals for things like TFCBT, then it can certainly have just really negative uh, impact on them long term. So I think you know, there's supportive parents that come in and they are very relieved that there is no STD or you know, pregnancy in older kids and, and that's great and I'm so thankful for them. But there are a lot of parents that are struggling with whether or not they're going to believe what's happened and so um, uh, we try to make sure that, that they understand that the negative, uh, sorry, that the normal exam in no way means that they should not believe what their child has said. Okay. Um, I'm going to advance it to our CU slide. I do have, there's one more question. I'll, um, I'll uh, ask you that here in a second. But if you are interested in receiving a CU, I know we're at the top of the hour, be sure to uh, email me and let me know your um, first and last name. And um, if you're watching in a group, just each person um, email me individually and let me know who the, you know, the group leader who, who signed in. <clears throat> um, so maybe this is for the last question. Um, this uh, person has a, a young child where there was a, a physical finding, um, but now the defense attorney is suggesting, well, she did it to herself. Have And the kind of question is, have you ever come, kind of across that argument? And do you have any sort of uh, references or suggestions? Uh, yeah, so we do come across that argument quite a bit. So there, there aren't oftentimes findings, and so when a finding does come up, then um, especially if it's a healed finding, we'll hear that. So maybe they, you know, put a crayon in themselves, or maybe they self-masturbated, or you know, some other thing like that. And um, there is a little bit of literature out there about kids that have um, like behavioral problems that would actually masturbate to the point of causing pain. But those injuries don't occur in the same area of the hymen as they do if they're inflicted by somebody else. So most, so normally behaved kids are not going to masturbate to the point that they actually injure themselves because, um, especially in young kids, that area is very sensitive. So when they would do something um, to themselves, like from a self-soothing standpoint, they're not going to go to that point that they actually cause injury to themselves. Uh, so that's kind of one part of that discussion. Um, there's some folks that will talk about, you know, horseback riding and gymnastics and different things like that. And, and there actually is some good literature out there as far as the, the really absence of um, specific findings for hymen injury in, you know, kids that are, that are active. 
I, I don't know where to tell you to go just to kind of answer that other than whoever the medical provider is for that would need to, you know, kind of make sure that they prepped the prosecutor to be able to go over those types of things and, and be able to address that stuff. So you know, that's obviously the defense attorney's job is to try to cast doubt on the finding. So it wouldn't surprise me that that argument would come up, but it should not be that difficult of an um, argument um, as, you know, as long as there isn't other issues like the child had some kind of um, fall off of a bicycle a couple of years ago where they did have some kind of genital bleeding and things like that, which, which has occurred in the past. Okay, thanks. Um, and so if folks have um, other kind of questions, you can um, forward them to me. We are at the top of the hour, and I, you know, all are kind of free to go. And um, thank you for spending your lunch hour with us, and uh, be on the lookout for next month's webinar. So thank you to everybody.